Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, June 20th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Xavier came across an interesting PowerShell script that disables logging. One of the standard techniques how you defend against malicious PowerShell scripts is to log all PowerShell and then to check and review PowerShell commands executed for malicious payloads. In this particular case, a trick is used that allows an attacker to disable the script block logging without actually being a administrator. Now, one annoying problem with antivirus that we have talked about a number of times in the past is false positives. Now, you would hope that antivirus vendors have procedures in place to avoid them, but of course, it's very difficult for them to test every single piece of software that's not malicious. Virus Total now offers a new paid service to help with that. If you are a software publisher, you may up upload your software collection to VirusTotal and have VirusTotal automatically alert you whenever your software triggers a false positive. Now, of course, it could also happen that your software actually uses a malicious component. We have seen this uh, quite often with Bitcoin miners and the like, and you probably still want to know that. So it's nice to have VirusTotal alert you in this case as well. Now you say, okay, I can already do this for free with VirusTotal. I just upload my software and then keep checking for updated scan results. The real nice thing of this paid version is that it actually provides an API that you can then integrate in your development pipeline, which then allows you to recognize any false positives before you even publish your software. And the next news item, again, no big surprise, turns out a lot of systems used to manage cloud environments are exposed to the internet and not adequately secured. A study by Laserworks found 21,000 of these admin interfaces exposed and this ranged from Kubernetes to systems like Red Hat OpenShift and Swagger. There are a couple more they looked for, but essentially they expose either web dashboards or APIs to the internet. As with all of these administrative interfaces, you should only allow access from very specific IP addresses at a minimum and even better, keep them on a private network and then connect in via a VPN. Out of the 20,000 plus containers that were found exposed, about 300 had no password set up whatsoever. And a special case here with Kubernetes, uh, 38 of them had a security and health check service running that also did not require any authentication. And it turns out that Google Home is not protecting well against DNS rebinding. DNS rebinding is a pretty tricky attack, but actually not that difficult to pull off a reasonably reliable. The way it usually works is that while you visit a malicious website, JavaScript is loaded in your browser. Now, this JavaScript is restricted by same origin policy. It can only send requests with all the features enabled back to the website from which it was loaded. What the attacker would do now is change DNS settings for the attacker's website to point to this internal device, like for example, Google Home. And then it turns out the attacker is able to access the Google Home device and in particular retrieve a fairly exact geolocation for the particular device. So this could, for example, be exploited via malicious ads that someone is using to then, for example, show pop-ups that will identify your exact location. And as the blog post here by Greg Young suggests, it could be used to make some of these extortion pop-ups and so look more plausible. 
We're talking about these DNS rebinding attacks actually in our defending web application class at length on day five, because they are a little bit tricky. They're often underestimated in what you can do with these attacks. Defense is actually not really all that difficult. Uh, what a web server has to do is verify that the host header is correct for the particular website you're accessing. That's of course tricky with devices like Google Home that you're usually accessing by their IP address. But even then, the IP address should be sent as a host header and not anything else. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.